Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yeah, basically, I'm working on uh, here. This paper is about the origin myth and Anglo-Indian identity, and I'm referring to Hugh and Colin Ganser's uh, Linsdale Raj. Um, so what is origin myth? Um, so the origin myth contributes in the formation of a co collective memory, a collective memory, and thereby forms several aspects of identity. Each community's origin or the myths related to its origin depicts or can be interpreted in some basic traits, cultural ethos, and the anxieties of the community in present time. And that is why when I'm reading uh, this novel, Linsdell Raj, I'm trying to see how uh, several aspects that are there or several aspects related to the origin of the Anglo-Indian community, how they can be related to the Anglo-Indian community in the present time. So in spite of their, uh, in spite of severe scarcity in critical studies in literary sphere, there are ample examples of representations of the origin of Anglo-Indians. And this includes both expatriate Anglo-Indians and mixed descent Anglo-Indians. So here I'm looking at both the expatriate Anglo-Indians and mixed descent Anglo-Indians. And if that category is not clear, then I will explain that later. Uh, <clears throat> mixed descent Anglo-Indians. Depending on the changing definition of Anglo-Indians over the course of time, uh, and social changes, there can be two types of literary representations of Anglo-Indians in English literature. British expatriates life in colonial India and Eurasians or European mixed descent persons life in India. So this paper aims to look into the representation of the origin of Anglo-Indian community in literature. Uh, so here I would like to associate various features and anxieties of the Anglo-Indian community with the history of the origin of the community. And in this way would attempt to trace the connection between the origin myth of the Anglo-Indian community and their present. Uh, in this, uh, okay, so in this regard I am actually reading this book, Linsdale Raj. So first I would like to give you a summary of what is there in this novel. So this is a story of John Linsdale, who is a Catholic child of Frederick Lewis, who was, so this story is based in a, a mid 18th century England, or rather it will again shift to India. So he is child of Frederick Lewis, who is a Prince of Wales, which means he is a son of the then uh, British king, uh, British King, uh, King George II, Hanoverian King. So his son Frederick's uh, Catholic child. So they were Protestant. And uh, this is a Catholic child, which is a marriage that uh, Prince Frederick could not uh, acknowledge that he has got marriage. So it is a, a child of a secret marriage. Uh, so in spite of being a John Linsdale, the main protagonist of this novel, in spite of being the rightful heir to the British throne, John's Catholic origin was a potential threat to the Deedan Protestant royalty and consequently a threat to his life in Europe. Uh, from his maternal side, John Linsdale was, uh, John E.L. Linsdale was the great grandson of El Elihu, Elihu, sorry, Elihu Linsdale the erstwhile president of East India Company's settlement in Madras and also grandson of uh, Barnard E. L. Linsdale, who, is a, uh, who also served as president of East India Company's settlement in Madras. So these are historical character. However, don't mistake this entire novel to be historical, but based on certain historical truth and lots of fictional stuff has been uh, included. And here I would also like to uh, mention that Hugh and Colin uh, Ganser, they are having Anglo-Indian origin. So when I'm reading this novel, I'm taking it to be a insider's Anglo-Indian's perspective on the Anglo-Indian origin. And definitely me being an outsider, it's my reading. So <laughs> complications are there. So to 
so now to come to the story, John L. Linsdell, to escape the impending threat of royal assassination in England and also to chase his dream of having his own kingdom in the valleys of Himalaya, John sets out on a voyage for India as a representative of the company, never to return to England. He is accompanied by, his, by a father figure who is a Keralite person who used to work for his grandfather in England. His name is uh, Shankar Nair. So in Madras, John encounters extremely malicious internal politics driven by jealousy, lust and for power within the small community of English people who were residing at that point of time in Fort uh, of St. George. So here John gets married to an India-born Indian girl of Armenian origin. Uh, her name is Anne Hockenian. So this leads to a partial ostracization of John because in that society, uh, at, at, according to the novel, <laughs> in the then society, an Englishman's marriage out of his community was looked down upon. So there were even a menacing endeavors to dismiss his position from the company. Amid this spiteful ambience, John decides to leave Madras and move to Calcutta. Even in Calcutta, he finds that there is no respite from this vicious attitude. So, uh, so uh, and also he, uh, in Calcutta, he faces that threat that his Hanoverian identity might get revealed. So there is again this chance of assassination. So he leaves Calcutta as well and he, uh, per, by being persuaded by his wife, he decides to uh, pursue his dream of ruling his own kingdom in the Himalayan valley. So it, this is John's journey in India and how uh, as an expatriate Anglo-Indian he is finding his identity in this country. So my paper uh, or rather my reading of this book is basically about how John is trying to find an alternative identity or rather an alternative meaning of homeland. Here he is trying to find a homeland in the Himalayan valley, which is a kind of dream vision that he used to have even in England. So he is pursuing that, but then how he is trying to relate himself to Indian identity and that's not through the way generally uh, national identity are related to, but he is trying to find an alternative to that. that. So India as an Anglo-Indian homeland, this section. <clears throat> One of the dominating and recurring theme of the novel is homeland and search for ideal homeland. In England, John's childhood was very much restricted and confined because of the possible threat that if British royal families, especially Prince Frederick's German wife, Augusta, Augusta gets to know about the existence of the Protestant heir to the throne, he would be assassinated. So his father and Britain has failed to give him what was rightfully his own and also took away from him a secured life in England, uh, his home by birth. Amid that sort of a stifling, deprived, threatened childhood, John often gets the dream of a secured land, a land to be his own. So now I quote from the novel. I stand looking out over my kingdom, thermal springs bubbling in the blue valley below me. I don't know the name of my valley or its location in the high mountains. All I know is that it lies behind a groove of, groove of wild elders concealing the pass they call Sanglila. This dream of John's remains, does not remain just an individual dream, but it's an expression of an Anglo-Indian desire for a suitable homeland. When he sets his eyes on this land of Madras, when he comes to Madras for the first time, uh, sets his eyes on this land from the ship, his expe he experiences a strange sort of familiarity with this land. So we can see there is an effort, uh, if we can quote there, we can see that there is a kind of, uh, he is trying to associate with this land in a mythical way, not just going by racial, uh, racially belonging to the land if, or by birth claiming uh, that I belong to this land. Since he can't do that, he is finding alternative to the 
uh, alternative to the ways of relating to a land and he is doing it in a mythical way. So John wants to embrace this land, wants to be absorbed by this land, not because he does not have a land to call his own, but because he feels there is a remembrance of things of past, of life lived before life. Hence John finds alternative way of belongingness to this land and this also manifests in the Anglo-Indian desire of belonging to a land. This belonging is not confined to racial identity or birthplace or is linked to something beyond the life, something, okay, something as mythical as dream connection. That is why when East India Company gradually begins to interfere with India's internal political affairs and marches again against a native king of Arcot, as mentioned in this novel, uh, native king of Arcot, Chanda Sahib, John questions himself if he himself if he himself belong to this land, why should he lead the people who are waging war against the people of this very land? And then he reconciles with this question in this way that uh, if John belongs to this land from an another life, from the past life, then already the king who is there in Arcot, that person might be an invader. So he is actually protecting his own land from a, another king who is an invader. So later when John is asked to fight against Hooghly pirates in Kolkata, uh, that's the menacing pirates of Sundarban Delta region. He is uncomfortable about it. He faces the dilemma as to whether it is appropriate for him to fight the locals of the land. But to his relief, he finds that these pirates are actually of Ohom tribe. Ohom tribe means maybe from Assam area. So they are from Ohom tribes and according to the information available to him, were of Chinese or Mongolian origin rather than local people of the Delta region. He even thinks that fighting the pirates, by fighting these pirates, he is actually going to help the local people of that Sundarban Delta area. And uh, so that is why he is kind of serving the local people and serving the land and he is kind of being a protector or fighting for the people of the land. So the novel also ends with uh, his beginning of the search for this dream land, Sanglila. Uh, this is the land situated on the lap of Himalaya, surrounded by exotic natural beauty. This land is governed by a sisterhood who follow a religious order named Mary Magadhali. Uh, and they are neither Buddhist, nor Hindu, nor Christian. It is an egalitarian society that functions on its own terms and does not follow the rule of Rana king of Ranastan, who, who, who are a local king. So this sisterhood doesn't follow their rule to whom that territory actually belongs. This is the land where John feels he will find to be his actual homeland after a long life of treachery, threat and deceit. Though John has never been to this place, but this place seems known to him. He knows it since childhood through dream and dream. And so this is a kind of an imaginary homeland. And the name Sangalila is reminiscent of Sangarila, the mythical utopia in the Himalayan Valley from James Hilton's novel um, Horizon. So Sangarila stands for a, a so now I'm going to this uh, another novel, James Hilton's uh, Lost Horizon, where uh, this place Sangarila stands for a mystic, harmonious valley, a place of perpetual happiness. It is isolated from the conflicting world and it's not ruled by, ruled or guided by a Lamazari. So, sorry, it, it is ruled by or guided by a Lamazari. In search for this sort of a mythical land, uh, so this search for this sort of a mythical land is typical to Anglo-Indian uh, Anglo identity because this is sort of an egalitarian society where racial barrier, religious barrier does not erupt as a hindrance to belongingness. 
That is why John's this search for this sort of a mythical society to belong to becomes a typical aspect of Anglo-Indian identity. Now, how John relates to the religion um, or on the basis of religion. So, religious myth and oh, Anglo-Indian identity. So, John also justifies his sense of belongingness to India in religious terms as well. As a devout Catholic Christian, John felt that he belongs to India because India was the spiritual home of Jesus Christ. He, he subscribes to this belief that Jesus Christ has spent all his formative years here in India studying under great Buddhist master in Kashmir. Christianity is really a reformed Buddhism and that is why this mythical association with Christ association with between this Christ and India ascertain his religious belongingness to this land. So here we can see that John as a representative of an expatriate Anglo-Indian finds an alternative sense of belongingness to a homeland through dream, through religion. Even though he does not belong to India racially, he associates himself with the land and the people of the land. Uh, he forms his own ideas of regarding who actually belongs to the land and uh, rationalizes his own belongingness to the land. Thereby he makes India a homeland. He justifies his action opposite to the protector of the people of this land. Uh, this aspect of connecting with the land and then making the land one's own one's home is typical of expatriate Anglo-Indian identity. Now there is also a, in John we can see uh, there is an alternative to imperialism and origin to uh, Anglo-Indian identity. So I will just not read and skip through it. So where uh, John basically gives an alternative to uh, imperialism, the idea of imperialism that comes with uh, British, um, he, he sees, he, he does not participate in any sort of exploitative business. He, he stays away from uh, this opium business and also anywhere where he feels that he is doing something wrong against the people of the land, he does not participate in that. Now again, marriage as a tool to obliterate racial barrier and the origin of Anglo-Indian identity. So how marriage is being used as a tool? to obliterate racial barrier. In this novel, uh, the, this novel provides an alternative to British perspective of India, or rather puts it in the light of expatriate Anglo-Indians. John Linsdale's marriage with an India-born Armenian girl challenges the general racial setup within the East India Company. Though uh, Karuna Mantena maintains uh, or discusses in her book, um, Alibis of the Empire, that all this racial discrimination of you can't marry an uh, 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 Indian or person from Indian origin started only after 1857. But this novel which is set way before that, we can see that there is a, there is a kind of stringent rule or rather untold rule against the, uh, against the uh, expatriate Anglo-Indians to marry anyone from Indian origin. Uh, like one of the person, one of the officers uh, in this novel tells John, she is an Armenian. It would ruin your career if, uh, so he actually wanted to marry her. So he's saying that she's an Armenian. I would ruin my career if I did not, if I did marry, did not marry an English woman. The company does not admit it, but as the influence of church and the Anglican church increases, it becomes more bigoted and hidebound about mixed marriages. So, however, John still marries Anne Hockenian. Yeah, I'm just completing. So, John still mar marries Anne Hockenian and goes against this. And this is again another way of his. Uh, his forming, or hence this marriage of, marriage of an expatriate Anglo-Indian like John with an Armenian girl like Anne Hockenian marks the advent of mixed descent Anglo-Indians and epitomizes the liberal racial outlook 
of the Anglo Indian of Anglo Indians as opposed to the straight jacketed racial barrier upheld by the British imperialists. So, in this way, uh, uh, my reading of the paper says that John is actually forming an alternative identity and uh, not just John, rather this Anglo-Indian community prefers an alternative community where the society should be more egalitarian, where this racial barrier, religious barrier, all these barriers that constrains you and puts you in straight-jacketed divisions, that can be uh, overcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much.